So I'm not too familiar with this. <laughs> so hello, this is Jimerello. Uh, thank you very much to uh, to Andrew for organizing all this, uh, this second conference on Rago. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is very little about programming and more about metaprogramming. So my, my last talk uh, related to Rago was about metaprogramming. This is again metaprogramming, but from a completely different point of view. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a bit about philosophy and a lot about art. So just check out the first slide. The first slide is uh, it's a painting by uh, an Italian painter, uh, name of the Peru. Uh, it's, it's a motorcycle. It, it represents pretty much uh, the spirit of the futurist uh, movement, uh, which I am going to talk a lot. Well, this is me, yours truly. I've been programming since 1983, so quite a long time. And in the stop, of course, I, I my passion is Raku. I also love Perl, but I. Uh, for my day job, I work in JavaScript and also Python and some other some other languages. Uh, what is my day job? That's a good question, because my day job is well, I'm professor at the University of Granada, but right now I'm also senior software engineer at Poly Poly, so that's uh, kind of part time. But anyway, I'm right there, senior software engineering, whatever that is. The basic idea is that people usually look for, for the, the language to rule them all, right? So the, the language that fixes everything, the, the language that's able to do anything. Uh, but then I look at the, at the uh, this is the repository at PolyPoly. PolyPoly uh, Poly is actually, what we are doing is, is creating a couple of apps, uh, one of them in Android and the other one in, in, uh, in iOS. And then and this is what you can see there. So you, you see that there's a little bit of, there's a lot of JavaScript, there's TypeScript, there's Swift, there's Kotlin, there is CSS, there is HTML. There is also some Python, some Rust. I haven't been able to put any record in there, but then, you know, uh, we still have some time to go. But then you see that not really, right? So it's, it's basically impossible to, to create a language to, to, to do everything. So when we, when we look at the development, we always look at it from the point of view of single language. That's not what's really happening. Uh, even, we, uh, even in the talk that Liz gave, for instance, we have mentioned several languages like Jan or XML. Okay, uh, admittedly, they, they're, they are not uh, Turing complete languages, but still they're languages. They, they, you need to know what they are all about, right? Regexes uh, and so, so forth. But anyway, we came here to talk about postmodernism. Uh, this is a painting that I, it's not really a painting, it's actually its actually a, a, a photographic reproduction of a painting by the Estonian futurist painter, Ado Vabe. It's called Italy. I like it because, because uh, I love Italy. Uh, but I also like it because it's one uh, of, the, of the futurist painters I discovered when I was in, in Estonia uh, last week. Uh, futurist is a, is a sort of postmodernism, right? So postmodernism is, is, is a generic term for, for many different movements that uh, comes in, in cult uh, culture and in arts and also in programming languages. But it's also, it's also uh, uh, I mean, if you want to do the, the postmodernism, you need to do it in some specific way. But we can see that it's, it's all around us. This is a, this is a church that's in, uh, very close to Trieste. It's in, in the Adriatic coast and it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, because not only the structure is, is pretty postmodernist, but, but also the paintings that are there, they, they will have the, the, this postmodernist look. And it was made uh, relatively recently because uh, this is, uh, uh, I think it was in the 60s or, or so. On. And it's all around us. It, it's in architecture, it's, uh, it's in uh, literature, it, it's everywhere. And I think that programming languages are, are not so different from the rest of, of the culture. Uh, at the end of the day, they, they are the, they are something made by humans. They can't escape that that trend. But can we say is there a postmodern language? So the, can we really say that uh, there's something that we can call a postmodern, absolutely postmodern language? Well, let's look at what postmodern is, and, and then we will be able to to answer to answer. Take a look at this picture. This is a very amazing. Uh, pop uh, art uh, painting by an Icelandic painter whose name is Erro E. 
RRO, RRO. And he makes uh, some uh, uh, American icons with, with some uh, uh, communist propaganda icons, like, like for instance, this one, right? It's, it's very good, I really love it. Uh, but let's look at what's postmodern. So first is it's an artistic and cultural movement. It's, it's not only art, it's, it's art and everything surrounding it. First, the most important thing, it's anti-dualist. And, and this, is, this is from almost every point of view. So for instance, it, doesn't, it says that there's no difference between the producer and the consumer of the art. So we can really put a barrier between the person that's producing the art, the artist, and the person that's consuming the art, right? But it's, it's also anti-dualist in, in the way that there is no difference between the art and the context of the art, uh, whether it, it's uh, uh, in a museum or, or somewhere else. So it's almost in every, every axis you can consider, it says, no, no, there's no difference between here and there. It's all the same. But it also claims some very important thing. It says that language models or shapes thought. So you use a specific language for creating something that's going to, to shape how you perceive that something. How you as an artist perceive that, how you as a programmer perceive that, how you as, as a something that, well, it's still the same thing. So there's no difference between programmer and the person that's running the program, right? But it also promotes pluralism and diversity, which is a, a good thing. It's a good thing in culture. It's a good thing in art. It's a good thing in programming. But not only that, it promotes diversity in the previous repository. So when we are programming, it doesn't say, no, 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 we are programming in this language. No, it's saying there is no difference between the language that we are using and some other thing. There is no difference between the, the JAML files that you use for, for CI and the language that you are using for an app, right? So it promotes that kind of explosion of diversity. How does it do that? Also, I'm not going to say Rago is the best language. Of course it is. It's the best language out there. But I answer to that question a little bit later on. Postmodern myth needs to be made, right? So it, it's a, it's, uh, of course, it's an ad hoc theory. It's something that, that people think about and say, okay, so this is a trend. So the, the, the jury actually need to do it. And you need to do it through some artist or cultural uh, creators or programmers, but also sit down and do it. Uh, this painting is by one of the painters that I like the most of the modernist, uh, I mean, of the futurist movement. Her name is Natalia Goncharova. It's very interesting that there are several, bran several, several branches in the, in the futurist movement. One of them is, very male, very macho, that's the Italian futurist. Another one is almost exclusively female, and that's the Russian one. This painting is not really a futurist painting. So Goncharova went through many different uh, phases. One of her, heavy, her initial phases was futurist. This is actually one of the, her latest phases, but it's also postmodernist, uh, and kind of futurist in a way, because she's mixing different things. She's not saying, I have this Russian cultural tradition of icons. They should be this way, you know, hieratic, golden, and so on and so forth. And I have this other thing, which is painting. It's a totally different thing, right? No, she says, no, no, no. I'm going to use this tradition. There's no, there is no, she's anti-dualist. There is, you can take every, anything you want from the tradition and use it for expressing thoughts, for expressing something different, right? This painting, if I remember correctly, is in, is in LACMA in uh, Los Angeles uh, County Museum. By the way, uh, every painting here is either some picture I, I took uh, at the museum itself, or for, from the Wikipedia, or from Google Arts and Culture, which is an excellent uh, resource, by the way, if you, you're interested in this kind of thing. Futurism, as I say, was one of the initial postmodern, uh, postmodernist uh, movements. Uh, started pretty much in Italy, right? Then moved to, to elsewhere. 
and just see this is another painting by, by a futurist painter, right? Uh, this is this is uh, if I remember correctly, I think it's by Marinetti. But you see, yeah, just imagine we are at the beginning of the of the 20th century. What people were painting there, well, okay, we are in the post-impressionist era. Already the, the first cubists were painting Picasso, uh, uh, Braque, uh, and so on and so forth. But but look at this. So it's it's combining first a motive that's totally almost totally alien from, from what was on before. It's also combining typography, painting. It's combining kind of cubism. So it's kind of making an abstraction of shapes. It's also including something called, I mean, all movement and dynamism. Dynamism is one of the most important thing. I and mean, it's, it's, you know, uh, putting words like France or, or things like that. So Futurist was the first, uh, uh, started to say something like, there's literature, there's painting. They say, no, no, we are anti-dualist. We can put some poem in a painting and we can do it in, in a very meaningful way. So mixing everything in the same language. Diversity, anti-dualism, that's, that's a set, the essence. I guess it, it also embraces all kinds of things like sculpture, painting, architecture, motion pictures. There's another painting uh, by, uh, I mean, so, so take into account that, that uh, uh, if I remember correctly, this is by, by Olga, Olga something, uh, or maybe also by Goncharova. I don't remember exactly. I, th I think it's Russian Futurist, but anyway, uh, it also features everything, but uh, also take into account that we probably have uh, uh, some something Futurist in, in, our, in our pocket, the, the 20 cent coin uh, in Italy, uh, Euro coin. Uh, includes an, an sculpture by, by Boccioni. He was one of the main proponents. So, so it, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that uh, everyone has. Uh, so it, it really kind of embraced everything, design, uh, painting, and well. But the thing about postmodernist language is that it's, it's a culture. So it, it stands to everything. It, it, it's, a, it's a world view. It's, it's a way of... Uh, of creating things. And it deploys new languages, right? Again, you, you see another painting here. Uh, I think this one was De Pero. This one says, there's no difference between the frame and the painting. I'm going to paint the frame. So the, the frame is going to be part of the painting. And it's going to be to, to, to have a dialogue with the painting. Uh, it's also about, you know, letters which are part of the painting. And so on. it's also a reaction, a reaction, I guess, monuments in academia. So it says, we're going to do away with everything that has been done before. We're going to create a, a true revolution. We, we don't care about monuments. We want to tear down monuments. They, they, they said, we have to burn down Venice to the ground. So we don't want people to look at that. We, we want to look at our context, at what we are doing now. So people are, are you know, take trains, people, people uh, take planes, people, uh, you know, move uh, very fast. They, 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 they live in this kind of apartments, everything. So uh, the environment, the, the, they look, it was totally different to, to the environment that was uh, created in Renaissance paintings and, and everything. You, you see that this is, this is really something that we could think about in engineering, right? Uh, and very important thing, it incorporates the environment. It says, why should I paint, you know, some, some landscape or some whatever. Uh, they, they literally say that the train stations are the cathedrals of the 20th century. And they paint train station. They, they, they look at the movement of train station, not from a static point of view, not from, you know, like impressionists have said, there is this smoke, there is this thing, you know, these colors, this, uh, no, it's totally different. They say, I want, to, I want to see the movement. I want to see the crowd. Of a train station, so the environment where where people do things is very important. Let's look at current development environments. So far, I've been talking just about art. Hope I didn't bore you too much. You know, and lately, I'm, I'm developing a passion about uh, about art in many different ways. So I'm writing now a book about Venice. Uh, but the thing is that okay, let's let's look at current development environments and and, and what people are doing now. Uh, there is web, 
there is a web, right? Uh, so we, we know it's there. It's, 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 you can't basically avoid it. Almost any, any, anything you do, 99% of the projects you do, they are going to be deployed on the web on some kind of web, right? Like an app or whatever. That's concurrency. Uh, look at the, for instance, what Liz ha, has on. Liz already includes in, in, her, in, in her utility this, this concurrency thing. It's something that you have to, to take into account, that, that you have to consider in your program. They are distributed. You, you can run uh, two tier or several tier uh, application, but of course you can you can think about more, more complicated things. They are also containerized. So when they are going to be deployed, you're not going to create some executable and then, then that executable is going to be copied. No, you're going to deploy, you're going to do scene, package, containerize, you know, then create some, some orchestration or whatever. So you, you do all kind of different kind of shit and that's environment we have today. And that's, that's uh, well, we have to take into account when we talk about something that could resemble a postmodernist language, right? Think about that. I don't know if you, you know this language. This language is born to web. It's, it's created for the web. So it's, it's a language that from the get-go says, okay, so I'm going to run on the web. I, I'm going to use the, all, all, the, all the sandbox that comes with the web and everything. It's got a object that's browser. Why? Because we're going to use a browser. No matter what, we're going to have a browser, right? HTML, we're going to use HTML for, for, the, for the user interface. So let's just do it. Let's just use that. No lines, no screen, no console. No, we have the web. This is our environment, right? So you, you import all kinds of things, right? And then you have, uh, what did you have in the, in the web? You have events. So it's got a very natural way of working with events. Actually, it reminds me a little bit of COBOL, which was postmodernist in a way. But it's kind of that because it's got like different divisions, you know, the update division, the any division, the view division, you know, it, that kind of thing. But it's very powerful. And well, you create a sandbox and then you run it. And then you create a view and then you say, well, I'm going to change this div, I'm going to do the stuff. And this is the program. The program is right here. So I, I compile the program. And it's exactly there. So if I if I write something here like what, it will run. And if I say some other word, it will. I don't remember exactly where the keywords are for swing doing something. I think it was rock. Right, rock and Sami, rock away beach. Right. So the script is already there. It's in the presentation, right? But let's look at another thing. Futurist says language shapes thought. I want you to look, at, to look at, at this wonderful, amazing problem. So it's, uh, you know, I, I'm telling you that I'm writing a book about, about Venice. One of the things I, I have been reading about is about Fibonacci, right? Fibonacci uh, was, in, was actually in Venice when, I, when, we, when he described the, the sequences, the Fibonacci sequence. Why did he do the Fibonacci sequence? Well, uh, it's an interesting story. It was because until Fibonacci, what people did was as, as follows. They use abacus, you know, this, this count thing, you know, this little little bed thing that are in, in, a, in, a, in a thread and you, you pass them around. They use that for computing, right? So the, the, that was basically the computer of those days. But they, they wanted to write the solution that was written in Roman numerals. So you use something to the computation and use something else to record the computation. He said, Wait, 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 wait. We have this thing that's using in, uh, in the Northern Africa. Actually, Fibonacci had spent some time in, in Algeria. And he said, well, they have this thing, this Indo-Arabic numerals, and they can do both things at the same time. They can add, they can do an operation, and it's pretty simple, and they can also record the operation. And he created the Fibonacci sequence to show that because the Fibonacci sequence is doing an operation, right? One plus one. And then the result is used as the operand for the next operation. So you have to go to the abacus and say, this is the, the number. And then you know you, you put it in, in Roman numerals, and then you, you go back to the, to the abacus and do that. You, you can do both things at the same time with the Fibonacci sequence. One plus one equal to two. And I am going to directly use the two. It's registering the, the result of the, of the uh, operation. And also, it's going to be used as an operand for the next one. And he did that with Indo-Arabic numerals. And we can do that in record, right? This, this 
short dish sequence, that's actually that. So it takes the uh, Indo-Arabic number, uh, in, in the number in, uh, in Unicode for expressing the sequence. Then check out this, uh, this, this second part. And it's because, well, when you use Unicode in Raku, you have to use the same script direction as the original script. So ranges are swapped around. Actually, in this case, it was more difficult to actually write the thing than to run it. So I, I couldn't do it with comma. I think that eventually I did it with Emacs because it was changing the direction all the time. And then I was doing weird things. Now, of course, we have to do trans because even if uh, a Raku can operate with uh, uh, with uh, Arabic numerals, the result of the operation is always given in Latin numerals. So you have to do trans so that you translate. And also, again, uh, I use the range, it's in the opposite direction. Lang language shapes thought. We can think about Fibonacci sequence in the same way that Fibonacci wanted us to think about it using Arabic numerals. And also, the result, as you see, down here, it's also within the opposite direction. So, so it goes from, from right to left, and the, the uh, lowest uh, uh, the numbers with, with the uh, less figures are right here, and the other ones are, are right there. Amazing. So uh, we can help a lot of people using Raku to use it in their own vernacular language, which is you know, amazing, right? But again, the world is web. There is this very interesting framework that is called Dino, Dino, uh, or Dino, 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 basically D-E-N-O, uh, is a framework for interpreting TypeScript and JavaScript, and it's written in Rust. Very fast, but it's also embracing the, envir the environment in many different ways. For instance, this, this is simply an app, and the application is serving things through, through a, a web service, right? So it's got an app, right? So it's, it's creating different cases or whatever. Every one of the cases is a, is a root. I am using serve from, from, a, from a standard library, uh, which is DinoLand. I mean, curiously enough, they have this land, same as we have Rackland. And uh, we can also render SSR, so we can, we can render uh, things on the server side using this, this thing. And we can, we can serve things directly. Good thing it's got the web in it. It's, it's something that, that it, it assumes it's a standard part of, of the library. So, uh, of course, JSX is, is not because it, you know, it's interpreting HTML or whatever, but you can you have an HTTP server directly on the, on the language or on the framework. Then you can serve it like directly. You see, it's, I don't need anything external. I don't need description of libraries. I use Dino, I use this. Well, I'm going to need something. Uh, Give me one second here. Well, I, I will show later on. But Dino takes into account what, what the program is actually going to use. We have also talked about distributed, right? We can use, with Julia, we have macros. We can, can run stuff uh, in, a, uh, in, in many course at the same time. Just from the command line, you say Julia-p4, and you can run it, for instance, here. This is a very small program that, that computes the uh, uh, creates random uh, chromosomes, you know, evolutionary algorithms. Yeah, that's that's what I do or what I did. And well, uh, it can use any any kind of uh, any any number of cores as soon as, as you do it from the from the command line. You by default is going to use only one core. Then you can tell it, uh, I want four processors, I processor sixteen, whatever is going to use it. And it's as, as simple as just using this this macro. This is actually a macro. In Julia. Well, uh, give me a second. I got lost a little bit. Yeah. Right. So it's opening yourself to the environment, right? But so you open yourself to the environment in the sense that there is a web, there is HTTP, there is the network, there are different number of processors. The language itself has to take that into account. So that's not something that, that runs in a very abstracted you know, processor with, with a single thread and so, so forth. No, that, that's a thing of the past. We have to take that into account. We have to be postmodern, right? And another thing, 
If it's not tested, it's not going to work. Tests are an integral part of development nowadays. So why not have something that does the testing, some assertion library in the same language? Uh, Node, for instance, in the, in the last version, uh, in Node 18, has included some assertions uh, as part of the language. Python has a unit test, and of course in Raku, not in Raku, but in Rakudo, it's not part of the language, but it's part of the, of the common interpreter. We have uh, use test, and we can use the assertions pretty much as part of the language, not part of the language, but you know, you know what I mean here, right? By the way, and also documentation. Documentation is a very important part of, of, the, uh, of any kind of development. Uh, many languages already have some kind of internal or external activities, but I think that Raku is the first language where documentation is parsed as part of the language itself. So here, for instance, in, in line number five, what we have is a, you know, small description say this is a feature, we're going to use it uh, this and uh, that way. And then we have all the assertions. We have test, subtest, okay, uh, uh, you know, all, all the things uh, is a part of the test. If it's, if it's not tested, uh, it's not going to work. If you don't have tests in your language, you don't have a postmodern language. You, you simply have something that needs something else to work. Uh, that, that kind of batteries included, that kind of you know, getting the environment uh, into your, your language is uh, something that's uh, very, very, very postmodern. Now, of course, Raku has it. Well, and then there are objects that open to the environment. Uh, again, this is an, another painting you, you can check out in, in the, actually haven't included in the, but this one, if I remember correctly, is by Boccioni. Again, uh, part of the, uh, of the Italian futurism uh, movement. Uh, I have also tried to to show this because one of the things that the, the Futurist said was was that the, uh, in a painting you should reflect at the same time the interior and the exterior of whatever you're representing. So they wanted to represent at the same time a city and the house uh, and the interior of a house. They wanted to represent at the same time uh, an engine or you know a locomotive or whatever and whatever was happening inside the the engine. So the, this painting kind of uh, reflects that. Uh, but uh, many languages already have objects like console, like IndexedDB. You know, console is a very simple object. It's something that you have in JavaScript or whatever. And actually, you know, standard input and standard output is something that uh, you have even from, from C. Uh, but there are some other more advanced things like IndexedDB, you know, having, having a database inside your language uh, and being able to use it straight away is, is something incredibly powerful and, and something that that uh, uh, some language uh, use. In this case, it's JavaScript that's embed in the browser, but you can also use something like that uh, if you, you work with, with Dino, or you work with, with JavaScript or with Node, right? Uh, at the end of the day, the, the thing is that uh, projects are going to need several languages or several DSL. Again, this is a, a, a painting by another futurist. In this case, it's, it's a British uh, futurist. In Great Britain, there was some uh, was a movement that was uh, was actually called vorticism. Uh, it was created around a, a series of, of uh, poets and and painters and, and also uh, different kind of writers. And this is by by uh, Nevinson, by an author called, called Nevinson. Again, it includes typography. It includes kind of cubism, uh, some some kind of uh, tones or, or shades of colors that could come from, from impressionism. Anyway, so you're going to need several languages or several DSLs in any, any uh, project you use. So why not have them or being able to embrace them within the same language? You, you're going to need uh, CI, you are going to need containers, you're going to need task managers, you are going to need some tools for deployment. Uh, Dino, for instance, in the last version includes something called Dino Deploy. So it's got some, some place uh, where you can dire directly deploy some, some what's called a JavaScript container, right? So it's not a container, but it's, it's a JavaScript program that's run within a sandbox that's created by, by Dino. So you're going to need many different things, right? Uh, in the case of, of safe languages like Dino, again, you are going to need to run something 
telling it what it can use and what it can't use. Security is something that's in the environment of, of development. It's not something that you, you add afterwards. It is, you need to, uh, to do safe things by, by design. It's very anti-dualist to say, no, no, this is not the program. And this is the security. Security is in the program. There is no difference. I there is no barrier that separates security from, from our thing. So in, in the case of Dino, for instance, you, in order to run something and allow it to use the, uh, to open a port or to, to listen to a port, you need to, to tell it to uh, you know, allow net or uh, if it needs to, to access the local file system, you have to tell it explicitly. Any kind of thing, you need to tell it explicitly. So security is, is baked in the same as in, in Rust, for instance. It's respecting the, the syntax itself. So we see that many anti-dualist things are becoming part of languages or frameworks that, that implement languages. Uh, so this, this being conscious of the environment is something that's very, very postmodern. Uh, and also Stack Overflow is the documentation of many languages. So it may, uh, it's, Pretty much so in the case of uh, many, many uh, uh, frameworks and libraries, as they just say, no, but yes, you, you, you have any questions, just ask in, in the Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is not a separate thing. It's not a separate, separate web. It's part of the language. So it's something that you, you are going to, to consider part of the canon that's in the language. Even more so if uh, we have amazing people like Rife, for instance, answering, uh, or Liz, or Jonathan Worthington, or, or many others were answering so amazingly. Physics, Steve, I mean, all of you, you, you probably have answered some questions on Stack Overflow and have really helped. That means that this is not the, the official documentation. This is the things that's not the official documentation. Everything is documentation because at the end of the day, you have a search engine. The search engine is going to give you hits in many different places and whatever fits the best, is going, you're going to use that as documentation. Uh, also, modern languages are multi-paradigm. They don't say, no, 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 we are object-oriented. We are functional. We are this, we are that. No, no, we are everything, right? Raku is object-oriented, functional, concurrent, procedural, trait-based. We can say that it's aspect-based. We can program aspects. It's a meta-language also. It includes grammar, everything, and the kitchen sink. And that's also very postmodern, right? Because it, it doesn't have like, like, a, like a mentality of saying, this is ours, this is not ours. No, no, everything that fits, everything that helps uh, uh, the user is good enough for us. Uh, Postmodern languages can even go, go even further. Community, documentation, ecosystem make the language and very much so. Uh, so it goes way beyond. And of course, when I say this, you're already thinking about something. You're thinking about Perl. Perl was explicitly declared as the first postmodern language by, by Larry Wall, right? So initially it had you know, many, many symbols like the camel and the Swiss Army chainsaw or whatever. But all of a sudden, uh, we started to talk about the, the onion. The onion has many layers. Those layers are all part of the language. So the state of the onion was the state of the language. And, and we were not talking, uh, Larry Wolf, when he was, we was talking about the state of the onion, he, he was not saying, you know, we have this, this you know, syntax in the, in the in version 5 point whatever. No, he was talking about the state of the ecosystem, the state of the, of the uh, community and everything else. And during one of those speeches, Raku was introduced. So Raku was probably postmodern from the inception, from the get-go. And it also included the community from the beginning. From the beginning, it said, we are going to do a community process to decide what's going to go into, uh, you know, the RFC, uh, uh, which we had uh, some, uh, something in the blog uh, a couple of years ago. So it was the first promoter, uh, fair, fair was the first promoter represented by the Onion, right? But RAC was a postmodern language, very much so, right? So it, you see, uh, again, another painting, can't remember, I should have taken notes <laughs> about this. Uh, anyway, from the looks of it, I would say it's also either Marinetti or Nevinson, probably Marinetti. Uh, anyway, 
from the conception of the postmodern language, you see? So, uh, but it, it is even more so because the language, the interpreter, syntax, and everything opens to the environment, the community ecosystem. And sometimes from Stack Overflow to Raku takes only a couple of days. Liz, <laughs> Elizabeth Metaysen reads the, the question, answers the question, saying, hmm, maybe they should go into the language. So again, you see, the community is, is creating new features into the language, of course, through, through the uh, amazing hands of, uh, of Liz. Uh, this is pretty amazing. I, I don't think that that responds, I mean, that happens in any other language. Uh, probably because they don't have this. Uh, but uh, if you think about it, it's, it's a very postmodern, uh, very futurist also mechanism. So the language design responds to community needs. It's not something that something someone says, you know, in his or her opinion. So this should be the most amazing thing that some someone is going to need. No, no, no. It says someone needs it by the community. Why not put it into the language if it is consistent with with some other things? Well. These postmodern languages live in a postmodern production environment. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an environment where, where things work already in a postmodern way, because we are, we are living in a postmodern uh, development uh, world. Uh, and postmodernists will probably spawn, spawn new postmodern languages. So we are going to have these new languages uh, all the time. So, uh, well, that's. That's the way it is. So it's, uh, we can do something, but uh, we can say that uh, the, the Futurist Manifesto, uh, they say that uh, uh, something that uh, we, we should, uh, they, they were talking about Futurist, which were, you know, what they were doing, and Pastist, uh, in Italian was Pasadista, something belonging to the past, right? What we need to do is we need to let Pastists us you know, belonging to the past languages, language, and embrace futurist languages, like Raku, for instance. Uh, problem is no language is totally postmodern, but development is postmodern. And again, Raku is probably the most postmodern language, right? Raku is pretty close to a perfect, from every point of view, uh, postmodern language. I think that the Russian futurists would be very happy when they, they look at this and say, well, Goncharova approves this. Right? It's impossible then to learn development with the same language. So I was going to talk about uh, how learning was impaired but by, by using past these languages. And I, it really is, you know, when people write to, to some environment, they say, mm, well, I'm going to do just Swift. I'm going to do just TypeScript. But, but uh, the thing is that uh, you can't learn development with a single language, be it Python, Java, whatever. You, you simply can't. Uh, you need a postmodern language, right? Uh, you can't even learn that language using a single language because you will still have to learn Torm and Jam and JSON and probably make files and probably some other things that uh, probably JavaScript because <laughs> sooner or later you're going to do JavaScript, right? So uh, postmodern is uh, what it says is that language uh, shapes reality. Development reality is too complex. To watch it through the lens of a single language. So if you have to learn, if you, you want to, to advise people uh, uh, to learn uh, how to program, just tell them to learn every language at once or Raku, right? Modern development deconstructs, right? Application needs to be examined, tested, compiled, deployed. You know, there, there are many, many things you, you need to do. Uh, so we need to say no to a single language. This is part of, of the, uh, this is a part of the Futurist Manifesto. It says control of sessiones de la cultura de control del monumento nacional. Basically it says against the obsession of culture as the national monument. I think that we have many, many national monuments uh, right now, right? There is C, there is Python, there are things. Uh, uh, well, Futurist uh, would, would uh, tell us to, to burn it to the ground. We are not going to burn to the ground uh, all those national uh, programming monuments. Uh, but I think that we need to be very aware that uh, uh, modern programming, modern development, modern uh, teaching and modern learning of development needs to, to be done in a different postmodern way. So 
embrace diversity, reject duality, postmodernize language and language learning. And that's all. Thank you very much.